You're watching The Swingmen, presented by the 94 Feet Report. Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Swingmen, presented by the 94 Feet Report. I'm your host, Simon Sharon Gordon, and I'm excited to get the colloquial ball rolling here. Let's first swing the rock around to our team. We have Hoops Habit and 94 Feet writer Josh Cornelison. Hey guys, let's talk some basketball. We have 94 Feet writer Levi Pitts. Howdy, y'all. We have our founder slash editor-in-chief, Eric Sparopoulos. Just want to remind everyone that Kemba Walker should have made the All-Star team. Right there with you, Eric. We also have our executive producer, Alex West. Hey, what's up, everybody? All right, let's get right into it. The opening tip. Los Angeles Clippers traded their second to last remaining vestige of the Lob City era in Blake Griffin to Detroit this past week, along with Bryce Johnson and Willie Reed, take, take him or leave him, in exchange for Tobias Harris, Avery Bradley, Boban Marjanovic, and a very lightly protected first round pick. Most of the reaction has been uniform. Detroit overpaid for a guy that the Clippers overpaid for just six months earlier. But let's just break this down from each team's perspective. We'll start with LA here, Alex. Why did they do this? You know, Simon, I think this is the beginning of, of a new era for LA, and everybody's talked about that, uh, but I think it's a very important step for Jerry West, who's taken a primary role as sort of an advisor uh, to have signed this contract with Blake, and then obviously had this whole weird thing where they hung up his jersey, but they've changed gears. This is a young franchise, and they don't have any one piece that's super enticing, but what they've done is they've put themselves in that position that you wanna be in to find the big pieces. Uh, they're gonna have a lot of cap room this summer and they have a lot of enticing players uh, in that Pat Beverly and Avery Bradley. You know, they can make a couple of more deals even if they go into the summer, uh, they can re-sign Bradley, they can re-sign Harris, they can deal Patrick Beverly. All of these things can be made and take small deals and make them into large deals, which I think is such a huge thing for the Clippers right now uh, because they were coming out of the Lob City era where everything just got kind of sad at the end. I mean, I guess sad is the right word. That's the word I'm gonna say. Uh, it got it got really sad at the end and then it felt like they paid Blake too much money. They paid him on legacy or whatever. But this team is new, they're exciting. They're not gonna be very good this year and they may not be good next year. Uh, but the future is looking bright for LA and I feel like they're in really, really good hands with Jerry West. Yeah, I mean, from a Pistons perspective, it's kind of the exact opposite. This kind of comes off as a really desperate move by Stan Van Gundy, who's both coach and president of basketball operations. He kind of realizes that he has to probably make the playoffs to save his job. They're not selling out seats in their brand new arena, which is a really nice arena that no one's coming to see. So he kind of said, you know what, we're going to attract and get a star that we probably couldn't get in free agency. And, you know, we're going to probably have to overpay for him. And we're going to have to bank that he stays healthy because when Blake Griffin's healthy, you know, he's pretty close to a top 20 player. The numbers he puts up, you know, 22 points a game, you know, seven or eight rebounds per game, about five assists per game. Those are really good elite all-star caliber numbers. The question is, can he stay healthy for more than 65 games in a year? And then the other question is, besides the actual fit of Griffin next to Andre Drummond, which could work because both big men are, are capable of ball. Uh, playmakers. Um, obviously, you know, they have to take turns uh, executing the post. Blake Griffin's added somewhat of a three-point shot. They're sorely lacking in perimeter talent. Reggie Jackson's hurt, and even when he's, you know, back and healthy, he's a you know pretty hit or miss player. Guys like Ish Smith, Reggie Bullock are gonna have to step up. And it shows that the Pistons, unless they make another move, have a lot of confidence in Luke Kennard and Stanley Johnson to step up, and that's kind of hard to rely on when you're gonna try and make the playoffs. So I think this comes up as a really desperate move to get a star to fill up seats, sell jerseys, and hope that he can work and make up for a lack of perimeter talent to make the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, it certainly feels like a pretty one-sided move. And from LA's perspective now, they have a lot of directions they can go from here. Levi, what, what do you think about where they're going from here? Well, there's really two options for the Clippers at this point. They could either try to make use of what they have in Avery Bradley and Tobias Harris and their core of Lou Williams and Jordan, or they could try to tank and try to get a better draft pick this year, try to stockpile some more draft picks, maybe get some more young talent. And the truth is, I don't know why they would try to make a push for the playoffs this year. If anything, they're going to end up in the eighth seed and just lose in the first round like they always do. Um, the Clippers really should just be tanking. They should be future. And with Jerry West at the helm, I think it's very possible that he knows that's the best option and he knows that that's where they're going. And 
they have their two expiring contracts in DeAndre Jordan and Lou Williams. They could easily flip those for some better future assets. And in the next few years, the Clippers could be looking at a pretty solid contender if they play their cards right. I think what's going to be important to remember with this trade is that time is going to give us some perspective. There were some big blockbuster trades that happened this summer with some big stars involved, and all of them look different six months later. Paul George trade, we thought the Indiana got fleeced. Well, Victor Oladipo is an all-star, and they're in the mix of the playoff race. The Bulls, they look like they didn't get enough for Jimmy Butler. Well, Larry Markkinen may be the best shooter, you know, best young shooter in the league right now, and Chris Dunn looks like a starter. Same thing with the Celtics, who were supposed to have lost that trade, now it looks like they won it. So uh, it's really hard to just call it right now. The reality is that Detroit got the best player in this deal, and Blake Griffin is a star. And maybe what they need right now is not the best value on their contract, but just a guy who's going to put butts in seats and give some excitement back to Detroit basketball. And the Clippers, sure, they got a lot of pieces, but now they have to leverage that to actually move in a positive direction. And there are decades of history for LA saying that they aren't good at that. And so I think that we should all maybe take a step back and even while we're trying to understand the trade, give us some time, let these things develop, and maybe six months to a year from now, see what really took place with these two teams. So while we're mostly pro Clippers here and pretty much around the, the NBA universe on this Blake Griffin trade, the jury is still out. But I want to move on to another trade that took a few days to play out, and that's Nikola Mirotic going from Chicago to New Orleans. How do you guys feel about this trade? Let's let's swing it to you, Eric. Where, where do you stand on this? The Pelicans, I think, won this trade. I think that, you know, they had to give up their first round pick, which they've done almost every year, pretty much, that they drafted Anthony Davis. But they get a guy, Nikola Mirotic, who fits in really well alongside Anthony Davis and or potentially DeMarcus Cousins if they re-sign him, if he can get back to full strength. Um, you know, a three kind of big man front court rotation of those players is, is, I think, really good and probably one of the best in the league. Miritic hitting 43% of his three pointers this year. He's averaging over 16 points per game. He gets a lot of spacing on the floor and you surround him with guys like Darius Miller, each one more, Drew Holiday. You suddenly have a lot of shooting around Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins. And the other side, they got off the Ashton contract, which, you know, I love Omer, but that contract is terrible. And, you know, Omer Ashton's do 11 million next season. Miritic is a team option for 12 million. Miritic is a much better player. So they had to give up a first round pick, but they get a really good player and they get off the Asha contract, which is why I like it from the Pelicans perspective. Eric, I totally have to disagree with you. And the premise is, while I like this trade right now, playing Miritich and Davis together may be able to make a playoff run that will ultimately get you swept by the Warriors. Uh, but next season, this is a very difficult prospect for me. Uh, Cousins and Davis and Miritich can't all play together. And that's one of the things I hate most about basketball teams is when you can't play your best five guys. The Cavaliers have been guilty of this for the past couple of seasons, not being able to play Thompson and Love at the same time. And I feel like we've gotten into a situation here with Miritich where he's a little bit overrated. Uh, he's shooting a little bit above his career average right now. And he'll make a nice piece for this team uh, with Anthony Davis. But in the future, I just don't see how he fits in. It's a move to me that reeks of desperation. Dell Demps is fighting to save his job. The organization is fighting to keep Anthony Davis. And when you couple those two things together, what you get is a move that feels uh, it feels like it doesn't move the needle for me at all. Uh, I, I, I see your point, Alex. My thing is that if they wanted to get up the Asha contract, which they probably would have wanted to anyways, it would have required a first round pick anyways. They could have stretched him over multiple years. That didn't work out. You can ask the Pistons how they're doing with the Josh Smith payments right now. Um, so if, they, if it would have taken a first round pick to get up Ostrich's contract already, you know, they got a pretty good player, Miritich, who I, I do agree he probably overrated at this point because he's playing out of his mind um, on a Bulls team that gives him as many opportunities as he wants. Um, but the fact that this deal, you know, the Ostrich plus first would have already happened if they wanted to get off the contract anyways. Getting Miritich in return and that second round pick, which is somewhat valuable um, if you can draft right, which I don't really have confidence in the Pelicans to do. But I think that because you're getting off Ashik um, for the first that you probably would have had to use anyways, you get Miritich in return who does fit, although probably not next to Davis and Cousins together at the same time. He can still probably play 30 minutes for you, provide some floor spacing around Davis or Cousins when they stagger the two bigs. You know, Drew Holiday's as good in the perimeter. Um, I just think that the, the combination of the shooting that they can provide with Miritich um, Holiday, Etwan Moore, Darius Miller around the bigs is what makes this deal valuable for the Pelicans. I see your point, Eric, and I don't necessarily disagree with it. I think for me, the thing that bothers me the most about this deal, picking up the team option in Meritage's contract, paying $12.5 million, to me feels like you really didn't get out from under the Asha contract. And I feel like that's what they wanted to do. They traded a first, and then they weren't able to get out from under the contract. So they're going to be in a pretty rough salary cap situation next season already, uh, and this certainly did not help things out. 
like I said, DeMarcus Cousins going out, it's really going to hurt this team. And they're not going to see him again this year, but the Pelicans aren't the only team that's really suffering from injuries right now. We had three All-Stars get hurt since the All-Star rosters were announced, John Wall and Kevin Love also going down. Now, Cousins, it's a bigger thing. A torn Achilles is a pretty rough thing for your career, but just for the rest of this season, guys, which injured All-Star will have the biggest impact on the playoff race? We'll start with you, Levi. So DeMarcus Cousins went out with his ruptured Achilles recently, and luckily was able to have successful surgery on it, but as far as the Pelicans medical staff can tell, he's gonna be out for the rest of the season. Now, what does this mean for New Orleans? It means they're out there, amazing 25 and 10 player that has been playing the best basketball of his career this season, and they're likely not a threat in the playoffs anymore. Sure, they can likely still make a eighth seed, maybe a seventh seed with this new Miritich trade, but without Boogie, there's just no explosion. And in my opinion, they were insanely entertaining to watch with him. And while Anthony Davis does bring a lot of attention, it's hard to say if Miritich and Davis are going to have the same draw as Boogie and Davis. Yeah, I understand that the Cousins injury is a huge deal, both for him personally and the Pelicans as an organization. But let's be honest, they were kind of fighting to just barely make the playoffs as it is. And with Miritich, I think they can kind of hold serve in a, in a certain kind of sense. I think the real impact uh, here is the injury to Kevin Love. And look, everybody puts him down, including many of his own teammates. But Kevin Love is really good, and he's played a really important role on the Cavaliers. He's shooting uh, the best from three-point distance that he has since he's been on the Cavaliers. He's spacing the floor. He's unlocking the offense. And uh, for all that he's not a rim-protecting center, he's been a really important part of Cleveland winning the games that they have won. Uh, he's the only player among the rotation with positive RPM both on offense and defense. Uh, LeBron can't claim that. Isaiah Thomas sure can't claim that. And uh, it's been Love, who I think has really kept this team afloat while other players have waxed and waned with their effort. Uh, and the fact that he's out up to two months not only means that they try to replace him in the rotation, but it means they can't potentially move him for better pieces. In addition, it forces a guy like Chan Fry back into the rotation. And now the Cavaliers might not be able to trade him, which it looked like they were locked to do to Sacramento to pick up help in the backboard. So this Kevin Love injury has a lot of repercussions for a Cavaliers team that is kind of at a crossroads and has to figure out if it can still be, you know, the team that flips the switch and gets back into contention or if they're really going to fade off into the distance as LeBron prepares to leave. Yeah, I tend to agree with uh, with Josh on this one. I think Kevin Love probably has the biggest impact just because that Cavaliers team has enough problems as is right now and can't really afford to lose them. Sad that John Wall didn't get a shout out here, guys, though. I, I mean, he <laughs> he's definitely like the best player out of these three, I think. And he's having a down year, but and Brad Beal's having a great year, but I, I don't know. I, I think Washington uh, is going to suffer more than they have so far. The Fast Break. Taking into account fit, contract, and what teams might actually be able to give up, what assets they have, who's the best player still on the trade market that could realistically get moved and where might they go? Eric? I think it has to be Tyreek Evans. The Grizzlies have already shut him down, and I know they're asking for a first round pick, but I think they're going to have to lower their um, asking demands, and Evans is going to get moved. He's playing really well on a really cheap contract. Teams like the Celtics could fit him in really easily. If not him, then probably DeAndre Jordan or Lou Williams, because the Clippers have already kind of accelerated that kind of on-the-run rebuild. I would have to say two people that are really high on the trade block right now are going to be Kimball Walker and Isaiah Thomas. They obviously shopped Kimball Walker earlier in the year despite Michael Jordan saying that he had no interest in it, but I think both of those players are two point guards that aren't really being utilized in the current situations and could easily move on to another situation should they see fit. All right, let's move on to number two here. Let's just get through this one quick, guys. Is there anything worth talking about in this LeBron to Golden State thing? I mean, or am I just feeding the absurd non-story by even asking you this? Simon, I do think there is something to this rumor, but I don't think it's about LeBron going to Golden State. I think that there could be something going on, a power struggle uh, with LeBron, with the uh, new CBA, something like that. This seems like he's sending a message to someone, uh, but I'm not sure who the recipient is supposed to be. While I wouldn't put it past LeBron to make a power move like that, I think this is him just kind of messing with people's minds, having respect for the Warriors organization that he'd take a meeting. Um, free agents always love to be kind of courted in free agency as well. Um, but this won't happen, and if it does, the league should just shut down because there's no point in watching the games if you were to join them. So no, no, no. No more LeBron James to the Warriors talk. I don't ever want to hear about this again. 
Yeah, and you know, as many light years ahead as Joe Lacob and the Warriors' brain trust might be, I, th I think they're actually smart enough to realize that this would be bad for the entire league, even for them, if, uh, if LeBron joined forces there. Let's move on to the next question, though. I want to talk about the Oklahoma City Thunder. If we look back a month, this team was kind of struggling a little bit, but they had a roster that looked like it could make some noise in the playoffs. Now, a month later, they're rolling. They're the hottest team in the league and they lost probably their best perimeter defender in Andre Roberson for the season. Guys, does the positive outweigh the negative here? We'll start We'll start with Levi on this one. Simon, I just don't think it does. I think Andre Roberson was a key to their fourth ranked defense in the league, and without him, it just falls apart. The stats don't lie. Paul George has been playing well defensively, but when he's on the floor and Andre Roberson isn't, they become, they go from a fourth ranked defense to all the way to the bottom. It's, it's just unsustainable to think that their defense or their offense is going to carry them through the playoffs without Robertson. You're absolutely right. Andre Robertson is a, a talented player, and he helps their defense a lot. But let's be honest. Come the playoffs, teams were just going to ignore him defensively, and he was going to hurt this offense, an offense that has been playing really well recently. Uh, Carmelo Anthony has finally accepted his role as the third wheel. Paul George has been balling out. Westbrook looks like the MVP candidate. And this team has the fifth best net rating in the league. Uh, they are coming on fast. I think they have a really good shot to overtake Minnesota and maybe even San Antonio. And if they're hosting a playoff series, I think they have a great chance to advance at least one round and possibly even two. So yes, the loss of Robeson hurts them, but he was the fifth best player uh, among that starting lineup. And I think the rest of the players that are still there are really good and they're only getting better. All right, last question here, guys. Greg Monroe was just bought out by the Phoenix Suns. The New Orleans Pelicans look to be an early favorite to land him. Is is that is it that simple? Is he going there, or is there another destination that sticks out to you? Simon, I think the ideal destination is the Boston Celtics. They have Aaron Baines and Daniel Tice, but they really need another big body to throw at people in the playoffs. Andre Drummond and Hassan Whitesides have destroyed them in the regular season, and they may have to play both in the first and second round of the playoffs if a certain playoff matchup shakes out, and that would be terrible, terrible for them. And since they have the disabled player exception, uh, I think that they will be the front runner to land Greg Monroe. Boston's definitely a strong candidate, and I think there are things to be said for Oklahoma City and San Antonio as well, who could both use a backup center. But the front runner here has to be the New Orleans Pelicans. They just freed up the roster spot, and they have plenty of minutes for him. Greg Monroe, in fact, would start for the Pelicans so that Davis doesn't have to be a center, at least not in the starting lineup. They're going to make a push for the playoffs, so he'll have a chance to be involved there. And let's forget, he was born in the New Orleans suburbs. He's a native there, and I think New Orleans has to be the front runner. All right, guys, let's let's lighten things up here. I want to talk about Jabari Parker's return from his second career torn ACL. Hopefully, he's back on the court for good. Josh, what kind of impact can he have on this Bucks team? I think Jabari Parker returning can have a major impact on the Bucks. They have a really good starting lineup, obviously focused around uh, all NBA player Giannis Antetokounmpo. But the four-man lineup of Giannis, Eric Bledsoe, Chris Middleton, and John Henson is a uh, plus 13.2 uh, on the season, which would be in the 90th percentile league-wide. So that their starting lineup is really good. Uh, their bench is one of the worst in the league, scoring just 24.1 points per game. That's second to last. Uh, and because of that, uh, the head coach, whether that's been Jason Kidd or now with Joe Prunty, they are playing the bench a very limited amount of minutes, just 16 and a half minutes per game, which would be 27th in the league. That puts a lot of strain on the starters. And in fact, Giannis and Chris Middleton rank one and two league-wide in minutes played per game. And that's just killing them and that can't be sustainable. So I think in coming back, Parker can really help this team by just boosting the bench. And specifically at the back of four, where Chris Middleton has slid whenever Giannis goes off the court and he's getting killed and the Bucks just aren't sustaining offense or defense in those minutes, getting outscored by 7.4 points per 100 possession. So I think there's a huge opportunity for him to come in to be the backup four and to really carry those bench units and help them sustain like a reasonable offense. Josh, I'm gonna go a step further on this one, and I'm gonna say Jabari Parker is gonna have a really big impact, provided that he's actually healthy and mentally ready to come back. Tearing an ACL once is difficult to overcome. Tearing an ACL twice can destroy a career just from a mental perspective. But if Jabari's healthy, he's a 20 point a game scorer. And that is an immense, immense help for a team that needs spacing, uh, that needs another scorer to carry them from night to night. And whether Jabari comes off the bench or he is inserted in the starting lineup, I think he's gonna have a huge impact on this Milwaukee Bucks team. 
Yeah, we all know Jabari Parker is a special offensive player. He not only put up 20 points per game last season, but he was very efficient with a field goal percentage right up there among the superstars. And I think another reason why his return can be really impactful is um, that it's going to kind of allow Milwaukee to evaluate whether or not to give him a max contract this summer. And if he can come back, like you were saying, fully healthy with that explosiveness and the right mental place, he can earn himself a lot of money. And I think Milwaukee would be happy to pay that because that means even though he suffered his second knee injury, he's come back just as talented as ever. And I think with the things that he's been talking about uh, as he's making his recovery and what he's been saying to the media, it sounds like he's in a really good place. And when he came back last year, he was more explosive and he did have a better shot. If he can repeat that feat again, not only would that be semi-miraculous, but I think it would help uh, propel a Milwaukee team up into the front of the Eastern Conference, where Cleveland, Miami, making a thing that he can't host a playoff series. Parker can come back at full health. Not only can he make himself some money, I think he can uh, help Milwaukee kind of hit some of its season-long goals. Josh, to build on this point, I think there's one more thing. Uh, with teams like Indiana and Washington sort of fading down the stretch, I think there's a really big opportunity for Milwaukee to jump in and maybe even grab a four seed. It's going to be between them and Miami probably down the stretch. But with the return of Jabari, uh, if they can grab a home playoff series, that would be a huge, huge boon for this young team. Buy or sell. All right, buy or sell time, guys, and we're going to start with Steph Curry here. So Steph started off down year shooting sub 40% on threes. Now he has a 6.75 true shooting percentage. That's better than what he shot during his unanimous MVP year, by the way. And he just finished off what was probably the best month of his career this January. Do you buy or sell Curry re-entering the best player in the world debate, especially with Cleveland struggles? Levi? Well, Simon, I am 100% buying it. I think Curry in the last few games has played incredibly. He had that 49-point game against Boston, and like you said, he's shooting, his true shooting percentage is 6.75, while also shooting nearly 50, 40, 90, and averaging 27 points per game, which is third in the league, by the way, overtaking LeBron, who had many MVP talks early on in the season. I think that he's getting close to, if not already at, the best or second best player in the world right now and he's just gonna keep playing that way guys we all know Stephen Curry is incredible but what's crazy is that he keeps finding new ways to be incredible his efficiency is through the roof this year his points per shot attempt he he's scoring 1.37 points every time he shoots the ball that's number one among all point guards percentage he's right up there as always right among the league leaders in three-pointers made um, but he's also just becoming more efficient with his shots. He's in the bottom 10% in percentage of uh, shots taken from the mid-range. Basically, he is exactly what the Houston Rockets are doing, cutting out inefficient shots to score the ball in places it matters the most, and he's excelling there. And I think that he's underrated on defense with his quick hands and his intelligence, he gets steals, uh, and he kind of sparks that Golden State fast break offense. So um, on top of all the just, you know, anecdotes about how he just unlocks that offense by stretching the court the stats really back up the fact that he is just shooting at an incredible level yet again and i think if you just look at all the other stars whose teams are struggling in different ways i think you have to point to curry as being right there for best player in the league all right from maybe the best player in the league to maybe this year's mvp james harden had to play without chris paul and trevor ariza the other night against orlando so he decided to go out, drop 60 points, grab 10 boards, and drop 11 dimes. It was the first 60-point triple-double in NBA history, guys. Do you buy or sell this as the best regular season performance you've ever seen? We'll, we'll go to Eric. I'm going to sell that one, actually. This was a great performance from Harden. Obviously, they were missing three crucial players, and Paul and Gordon, two of their most important offensive players. And yes, 60-point triple-double is absurd, and he broke the Rockets' single-game scoring record. Um, but I'm going to go back to Harden's New Year's Eve 2016 performance against the New York Knicks, where he had that 53-point 16 rebounds, 17 assists, triple double. Uh, in that game, he accounted for 95 points through his scoring and assists, um, which is second to Will Chamberlain in his 100 point game back in 1962. So that performance is actually a little bit more impressive to me than Harden's uh, 60 point triple double, though obviously both are absurd performances and probably key reasons why he could be the MVP of this season. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on this one, Eric. I even go back to, not to talk about Steph more, but his game in 2016 in OKC where he hit 12 threes to tie the NBA record, including like a 
40 footer, if we're talking just impressive feats, that's the most impressive game I've seen. Harden's stat line is a little better, but I do want to point out that he was a net, net, uh, net nothing in this game. He was his plus minus was zero, and this was against Orlando. So it's hard. It's hard to call it the most dominant performance when you're uh, not even the reason your team won, according to the the on off numbers. All right, guys, back to Boogie, back to New Orleans here. Cousins was supposed to be along with Paul George, this summer's premier non-LeBron James free agent. But unfortunately, the history of guys returning from torn Achilles is shaky at best. And look, DeMarcus Cousins, he, he carries other risks to begin with. It's part of why Sacramento traded him in the first place. Uh, guys, do you buy or sell Boogie getting a max offer this July? We'll start with Alex. Summit, I'm going to buy that he gets a max offer, but it's going to be from New Orleans, and I don't think he'll get another one. Uh, the Achilles injury is a four to six months injury, quote unquote, uh, but it's really more like a year to get back. And for some guys, they don't get back at all. And I think New Orleans is in a desperate situation where they're going to throw the max at Boogie to retain him because they want to keep that core with him and Anthony Davis. Uh, but for other teams, I feel like this is probably something that is going to keep them away. All right, Alex, I'm going to have to agree with you on some front. I do think he's going to get a max contract from New Orleans, but I also think that there are a few people out there, a few teams out there that are are going to be looking into him maybe they will offer him a max contract maybe they won't the achilles is a huge injury but i'm definitely going to buy him getting a max contract and that's because if he isn't able to get a max contract on the market which doesn't seem likely but i certainly think it's possible new orleans is going to swoop in and they are not going to let him walk there's just no way whatever happens guys i'm i'm rooting for him i mean it's finally had a taste of the postseason coming his way. At least give him that that big payday, something. Um, and I really hope we see the DeMarcus Cousins that we've seen for years back on the court at full strength. The opening tip. All right, guys, let's take a look ahead with the scouting report here. What are you most looking forward to this coming week? All right, well, Simon, well, I'm really excited for this Raptors-Celtics game coming out on Tuesday. I think that, you know, they're the top two seeds in the East. I'm thinking it's going to be a really cool game, and I'm thinking the Raptors are going to crush them. I'm looking forward to seeing how Nikola Mirotic fits in with the Pelicans. Obviously, this is a pretty big move for New Orleans, having lost Boogie and now trading their first-round pick to get Mirotic. Let's see how he fits next to AD. Let's see if they can add Red Monroe. Let's see how much shooting they can put around AD and Drew Holiday and see if the Pelicans can sustain that playoff time moving forward. I think it's a very fascinating trade for the Pelicans and a very fascinating potential fit for Mirotic in New Orleans. Simon, for me, it's still going to be a Tuesday night game as well. It's going to be when the Thunder visit the Warriors. Uh, this game's going to be pretty exciting for a multitude of reasons, but not the least is Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant getting together. I know they said the beef is a side, and they're even playing on the same all-star team, but I always love it when these two teams get together, so hopefully we'll see something great. I'm going to be watching for in the next week as the trade deadline approaches is what are the Cleveland Cavaliers going to do? Because they have to do something. There's too much pressure on them to win while LeBron's there. Uh, and with Kevin Love injured, due to go that who's gonna, are they going to trade to get an upgrade? And I think one place they may start looking is Isaiah Thomas. And just letting you know, the money works for an Isaiah Thomas Lou Williams swap. That could be fun for both teams, and maybe give Cleveland some punch in the backcourt. All right, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Any last-second shots, buzzer beaters before we close out here, Levi? I just wanted to say thank you for having me, and I really enjoyed it. Just another final reminder that Kemba Walker should have been an all-star this year. With the bad season that Jay Crowder, Isaiah Thomas, and Avery Bradley are having, can we finally talk about the Brad Stevens bump being a real thing? So I heard a rumor that Eric was trying to trade me to Bleacher Report, but luckily I had a no trade clause, so I'm sticking around. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching The Swingman presented by the 94 Feet Report. I'm your host, Simon Sharon Gordon. Make sure you hit that subscribe button down there so you don't miss our future episodes. And we'll see you next Friday. Thanks for watching The Swingmen, presented by the 94 Feet Report.